This conference will now be recorded. I think you might need to make her an organizer or something. It's it's letting me now, I think. It's letting me do it. Let me see. You should be able to make her an organizer or a presenter. An organizer, I think, or a presenter, because I'm trying to share the screen here. Okay, sharing screen. A window. Okay, I'm going to share the entire screen, and then I'm going to work my way to the presentation, because it's a little different than the Zoom that I'm used to. Oh, dear. It's giving me a hard time. Bear with me here. You know, that's what we want. Share. Okay, I'm using a Mac, and the Mac is a little finicky when it comes to, um, it's telling me to dismiss and restart my browser. Is there a way that I can send my slides to one of you, and you could show it on your end? I mean, if you sent them to me, it would be fine. If you put them in as an attachment Good to job. Herb, and I Herb? will try. Herb at ancan.org. And I will look so, for them. What I was trying to say is I'm trying to um, put together kind of a program, as I've, some of you and I have discussed, a program that's actually going to cater to the need to create a GU research program geared towards prostate cancer that will allow us to, of course, serve science, as we all want to, but mainly put at the center of the patient and his needs, while, of course, trying to offer cutting edge options for research. This is where your views and your thoughts become extremely important because the view of life where I was before was of course serving science, but not always listening to what you guys have to say about what we need to do to make it a, an improved experience for you and an outcome that's tangible for you, not something you have to wait for years and years until it, it, it reaches you. So let me try to share the herb. I'm putting it in an attachment right now. And I need I'm to- I'm opening up my- Yeah, I need to uh, save it as a PowerPoint because I use Mac, which means I use Keynote. You, you say, you, you, all right, you're using Keynote. Yeah, do you have a Mac or are you using a- No, I have a PC. You have a PC, okay, so I need to fix that. Give me a minute. Is there anybody with a Mac that could do this easier? Not me. That's okay. It's okay. It's just that Mac is so easy. I already changed it, so it will be in here. Okay, export. Uh, Herb, Alan Badcock said he has a Mac. But it, it, no, if she put it into um, as a PowerPoint, then it'll be fine on a PC. Yeah, it might just do it need a little bit, you know, just the format might be a little bit more. Okay. Okay, I just sent it to you, her. So you should be getting it as an empty. With an attachment, no title, nothing. I just okay. Did. Yep. Got it. Got it. I, let me. I will wait for it to get here. I will just bug you to say, let's go on to the next slide. Now I'm going to spend a little bit of time with some definitions. Right, some definitions of what we consider therapy development, because you always hear us speak, you know, in research about what is the drug development of each drug. But I want to kind of clarify the difference, because what we're after in this collaboration is therapy development, which is a bigger view of life. It's kind of the strategy that we need to use in prostate cancer 
to get to our end goal. So whenever you're ready, Herb, tell me so I can't see anything yet. Rick has just arrived too. There he is. Hello, hey there. Just me. Just made it in time. I'm so sorry. Hello, e. <laughs> Hey, I was for the first time in, you know, before time. So I was like, I expected you to be oh, a little late. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed. I'm already in. Not at all. We're, we're having some technical difficulties. We're trying to launch my slide deck. Uh, we're just, uh, we're, no, I'm um, the PowerPoint. I'm just about to try to display a PowerPoint so presentation and my computer is kind of choking. Oh, okay, okay. We can well, see that it's okay. doing something. Let's... It's thinking. It should get there momentarily. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, Dr. Ree, I was really counting thinking. On... I was Maybe counting somebody on... has a... F... <laughs> All right. So, we've got... Oh, we got 41 people. It, this is shut. My computer is not cooperating, guys. Herb, you want to send it to me? <clears throat> what, 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 what is it's the, like it's a big file? It's, it's a small file. It's a 10 megabit file. It's not big. Yeah. Send send it send it to Len or is Rick Johns is uh, Rich Jack Rich Jackson's on send it to Rich Jackson he's our main man. So guys, Rick, I, I know I, how to set it up so Dr. E can share the slides herself with screen share. I'm trying to do that's what I exactly I'm trying to do, and I'm yeah. trying to share my entire screen, you guys. And it's not letting me. Let me see again. Okay, I'm doing it right now. Can you see my? Okay, it's my Mac that's giving a hard time. Um, let me because it has a lot. I need to go into preferences. It's telling me and fix the problem. Okay, but first of all, we have to make you a presenter. Yes, you I already did that, Rick. Okay. Um, I, have done that. okay. I think it okay. took. Did it take? Okay. Herb, are I, you showing it? Well, I can't see. I can't see how to do that now on this new interface. It doesn't give me the. It doesn't give me the option, but that's okay. I'm in. I'm in late. Um, I think well, once we, once once I once she was made a presenter, it no longer appeared as an option. So I think she is. Uh, Okay, that could be. Okay, that Herb. could be. Herb. Well, you're the presenter now. Okay. Herb, what's going on there? Can we send it to somebody else if it's not working? Herb's, I think we've lost Herb altogether. Looks like he's well, muted. Yeah, he's muted. So this isn't this isn't so good. There oh, you go. oh, you get it. I'm not muted. We're on. We're on. We're on. Okay. I don't know so, who did that, but it worked. It's, okay. So Herb, put it on display mode so that everyone can see the whole. Uh, yeah, I'm trying. You can see stuff. It's there. Okay. It's yes. there. It's there. You're great. You, there you go. There Perfect. You go. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So as I as I said, you know, it's gonna be. I'm going to try to keep it short, about 20 minutes. And and then, of course, you know, you can react, as I can see down there, and kind of interject. Or if you have thoughts, ideas, comments, we can leave them to towards the end because I know you're going to jump to a different meeting around 7 our time. So we've got about 15 minutes right now. So as I said, this is more of the vision of how we would like to develop this therapy development strategy. And this is something that we've discussed with our urology team, our radiation oncology team, and of course the leadership and Mark Boom, who's our CEO, and recently went into a town hall to discuss all this. 
So let's get to the next slide, which includes my disclosures. So you, you see a lot of disclosures there. And actually, as you're going to see during the coming GU ASCO, and congratulations, you guys, I know you have this poster upcoming. I'm going to be presenting some updated information from big phase three trial settings that have to do with the use of PARP inhibitors. I think that, that Rick, because this is going to be a very big meeting in GU ASCO where three trials are going to be presented essentially with updates. And I promise you, one of them is going to be extremely positive, kind of changing the way we think of things. We'll have to revisit uh, probably during 2023, these ideas of how we should combine drugs. But let's talk a little bit about the difference between what is a drug development and the therapy development in medicine. Let's go to the next slide, Herb. So coming in a little slow. So drug development essentially is very simple. For those of you who've been involved, you will know that it's kind of going from point A, which is inception of a drug, to getting the drug FDA approved. That's all that is drug development, nothing more than that. So usually you see these big phase three trials that are being presented and all they're looking at is if this specific intervention or the specific drug will lead to the approval. That's all they care about. Let's go on to the next uh, slide. Uh-oh, go back one, uh, Herb, because it didn't, it missed it. So if we go back, you'll see that therapy development is a little bit of a different thing and it got cut off because of formatting there. Because a therapy development is more the effort to look into what should be the correct sequence or combination and the strategy that is needed for the correct allocation of each treatment at the right time. It's a much convoluted event, and that's what becomes, becomes very elusive in our field. So you all have heard there's this A, B, C, D, E, F drug approved, but how do we sequence them and how do we combine them in a way that you maximize the output for yourselves? the individual patient. That's the big concern. Let's go on to the next slide now. So for, to do that, we have to take into consideration the variables. And the variables include the disease. And here in this slide, what I've kind of put in is a graph of prostate cancer. And I'm talking about the real prostate cancer, not about low risk. I'm talking about this type of prostate cancer that is high risk, localized, and above. It may be metastatic, hormone naive, de novo, which is what we also like to call synchronous. It could be metastatic based on advanced imaging, which is the PET scans, or it could be based on conventional imaging. And then you see a cascade of other stages of the disease. But the biggest unmet need that we have in our world is the one that's on the left, the localized or locally advanced high risk disease. And I want you to think of it a little bit differently than what sometimes even physicians present it. High risk disease is an entity on its own and it's enriched for a disease that has a potential to be dynamically more aggressive. So essentially, we should consider high-risk localized prostate cancer of high Gleason score the equivalent of an aggressive breast cancer, the equivalent of a triple negative close to breast cancer sometimes. So we have not really invested enough of assets in this disease setting to try to address that unmet need. And even though some people may say, well, metastatic is always worse, I would argue that high-risk localized disease is more enriched for that phenotype that can be imminently threatening. And imminently, obviously, you guys, is a different word when used in the setting of prostate cancer, I mean in several years, rather than not. So that's where the big problem comes in versus a disease that's a Gleason 7, for instance, that was intermediate risk, and years later, it might develop into 
a disease with a few metastases. It's a different disease. That's what's the bottom line. Let's let's hit the next uh, slide, uh, Herb, that it should enrich for more things. So this little graph that I put there is the the genome sequencing of a prostate cancer. Each little circle is one prostate cancer. Oh, I got him! 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 I got him. I got him. Okay. Thanks. So these cancers that you see in the bottom here, I have put seven genomes of cancers. And if you look at the little circles, you will see they're all very different. These are cancers that have come from men that have the same Gleason score, that have the same age, that have the same clinical characteristics, and the DNA of these tumors could not be more different. And I want you to think, because I know you've been in different talks and discussions, that it's not just about DNA. It's also about the RNA. It's also about other events that lead in the tumor microenvironment to what is the final product, that cancer. In the middle of that bottom section, I also have put a little graph from a paper that's about five years old now that shows each of the little tabs that you see, the tablets, shows the difference that you see genomically in a prostate cancer, whether it is hormone sensitive and just been diagnosed, or later when it relapses, or even later when it's been exposed to different drugs. And the little dots and colors that you see, you don't have to understand all that unless you know you're you're a scientist, like you know, some of you on there. But the little dots, all you need to look at is how much more of this quantity of dots you see on the far right. That means that the cancers that are more advanced, that have been exposed to more drugs, are actually enriched for more DNA aberrations, more mutations. And you would be sitting there and saying, hey, duh, this is common sense, right? Well, for us docs, as you know, that common sense is not that common. So that's another problem. As the disease progresses, you get this temporal heterogeneity. So you have heterogeneity within each tumor. You have temp temporal heterogeneity over time. And finally, you have this heterogeneity that is within the host, within the unique being, right? And that, of course, defines your immune response. That defines the interactions within the tumor microenvironment. That defines the alternate growth factors that are going to be potentially employed by the malignancy. So just by, by going over this, you understand immediately how convoluted the issue is, especially with prostate cancer. And we have discussed with a lot of you how much the metabolic syndrome comes into play and how much it can actually take over when, for instance, we have depleted completely the androgens. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so what do we need? Of course, in order to develop the therapy, we need drugs, drug development, right? But what we really need and we have not achieved is biomarker development. We need the simple thing, the very simple thing. You all get a biopsy. The biopsy that you are given says Gleason, Gleason 7, 8, 9, 10, because Gleason 6 is not a real cancer, right? It's a cancer wannabe. But that really, at the end of the day, as you, a lot of you have understood, it's just somebody looking at a microscope and looking at the morphology, nothing beyond that. Unlike the case for breast cancer, where from that biopsy, you already have a very clear understanding of all the biomarkers that may be implicated in deciding the therapeutic plans. And then, of course, beyond biomarker development, we need to actually understand that interface between the host and the tumor. Finally, and it's not trivial, this is where you, you come into play, is what is the real world practice and how can we translate what is in the research to real world 
And you know who has been very good about it? The British. They were the ones who developed about 15 years ago this Stampede program. As a lot of you may have heard, with Stampede, we have been delivered a lot of data, including data in high-risk disease, that is moving the needle to favor better survival, better outcomes, better everything. The trials that they are running are real-world trials. They are nothing more than patients who go to community practices and enter that research. And that is why it has been so successful and it has been like wildfire for the UK. And finally, maybe one of the most important considerations that a lot of you have also read about is that the fact that there is a drug approved doesn't mean that it is accessible to you for many, many reasons. First of all, there is a lag time from the approval to actually integration in the clinic. For instance, we know that since 2017, we had approval for use of enhanced antigen signaling inhibitors, such as abiraterone, enzalutamide, more recently apalutamide, and now geralutamide in the hormone naive setting, but only 50% of patients, 50% in this country, are given the opportunity to be exposed to these drugs as early as they should. And that is not a criticism to the physicians and their practices. This is a criticism of how the system works, right? There's not enough of time, essentially, which is the biggest commodity, to actually integrate in the clinic. And they're usually battling insurance copays and what have you. You know all how it goes. So these are the requirements. And each and every one of them is equally important to actually get to the product, the deliverable, which is getting in every clinic around the world the same level of treatment for the patient, right? So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, drug development, we've done it. We, we, we're there, essentially. Remember, we started back in, you know, 1940s, you've read about it, with, with essentially introducing, back then they were doing surgical castration. Castration, but, right. Right. And then they moved on to using chemotherapies because that's what was understood as anti-cancer approach. But more recently, you see this slew of events of different drugs that are approved. And you've probably heard that recently, combinations of enhanced antigen signaling inhibitors and PARP inhibitors. The FDA just approved the one of abiraterone plus olaparib, regardless, regardless of presence of BRCA mutation. The same happened with Europe. It's even approved in Brazil now. This is what's going to be a big discussion next year. So essentially, we also got last year the approval of lutetium, PSMA, with all the limitations of access that a lot of you have experienced, but we are moving in the right direction from a drug perspective. But what remains very elusive is how we should prioritize this. What we have understood is that enhanced antigen signaling inhibition should come very early in the disease setting. But what we don't know, for instance, and I was just having a meeting over that today, is how else early we should include PARP inhibitors, or for instance, lutetium PSMA. And the trials, as you know, are ongoing. But the trials that are actually happening right now are not comparing active agents. You may remember that there are trials that are actually using as their control moving from abiraterone to enzalutamide or from enzalutamide to abiraterone. That approach is erratic. It is not correct. It is not even, I dare say, ethical because we know that for 80% of patients who fail on one of the two drugs or of the four, the other is not going to offer more. There's only one exception where this can be of great benefit and we can discuss it later, but that's a very small minority. So the FDA is doing better as of this past year and is mandating better control arms. This is gonna be a very good opportunity to actually run trials that are real to life and are actually going to help us develop therapy better. So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so we've got the 
drug development. Let's go on to the next slide her, about biomarkers. So when I was a kid, and it was 1997, finishing medical school, you know, in Europe we go when we're like 17 years old. Um, there were the first data that was reported, you will not believe it. This is 25 years, right? 25 years when we had the first data reported to suggest that there is genetic predisposition to prostate cancer. 1997 by Rosalind Eels. This woman is a medical oncologist and a geneticist in Great Britain. 25 years later, she has still not convinced her country to have genetic testing for men with prostate cancer. So this is how hard it has become in some countries with more socialized systems. But even here, it took us 20 years to actually understand that there is a genetic predisposition for prostate cancer, especially when you identify mutations such as BRCA and the BRCA families. From 1997, it took us 18 years to report in a big trial that actually beyond genetic predisposition, there is a high incidence of events within the tumor that are BRCA or BRCA-like even if there is no germline event. And of course, as you all know, this fast forwarded to the trials that we now have that led to the approval of olaparib. We're probably gonna hear soon about talazoparib and iraparib in the field. This is way too long. This is what we need to create a shortcut to. And even to this day, if you take a wild guess, and I know that Rick and Herb know the numbers, only 5% of men with high risk or metastatic disease are offered germline testing. And sequencing of the tumor, most of cases happens later in the disease setting rather than early on. And a lot of physicians actually say, well, I don't do it early because there's no access to drug earlier. But I would argue that a lot of those findings that you can find in early disease can define if you have a disease that is highly aggressive and may have a bad prognostication or a disease that might be more suitable to treat with enhanced antigen signal inhibition. So a lot of information to get out of it. But the problem here is cost, that is getting better, time, access, and understanding. Understanding even in these community practices, right? A lot of the physicians are not in tune with doing these types of tests. Let's go on to the next slide. This is of course where you guys become your best advocates, right? Let's talk a little bit about this whole androgen signal inhibition. I am guilty as charged. And if you go back and look at what I did, you know, when I was finishing up my training, I was doing a lot of these initial trials looking at molecular biomarkers or how to best treat with drugs like aberadron, enzalutamide, apalutamide, and the, and the Y. So what we did back then is if, if you were, you know, in training in 2006 and seven, as I was, and you showed up and said, I truly believe that there is room to treat this disease beyond castration, people would laugh at you. They would say, no, no, no. Then the disease becomes androgen independent. So I'll tell you a little story. There was a guy next to me when I was presenting my first poster discussion at ASCO, really proud, jumping around, you know, like a thyrotoxic bunny because it was my first presentation and you're top of the world. And there was this guy sitting next to me presenting this data that was amazing about an oral drug called back then abiraterone that had been sitting on a shelf somewhere in the UK and a small company had picked it up called Cougar Biotechnology. I approached the guy and I'm like, what is this? This looks good. I mean, people are getting better. They're living so long. And, and he's like, yeah, but you know, I told my chair then, can we do something with that? He's like, you're crazy, but okay. If you can get a little drug, you can do a trial. Fast forward, this was the time when, you know, with small biotech, you can do trials. Within a month, I was running a trial for people who had failed chemo, had failed everything, and we were getting these amazing results. And this kind of changed 
the world on what we were doing with drugs like abiraterone and moved away the research from looking for chemos and chemos and combinations with chemos. But when we started reporting this data, we invariably saw that 30%, 30% of tumors were highly resistant from the beginning, from the get-go, to drugs like abiraterone and zalutamide. And I can guarantee you, because we did the trials in the new adjuvant setting, in the high-risk localized setting, that that even happens when you come earlier in the disease. So these first studies really showed us that there can be, even in this early disease setting, resistance, resistance to these enhanced antigen signal inhibitors. Now you're going to say, well, wait a minute, 70% of people are responding. Why do we care about 30%? Well, that's what precision is all about. That is what therapy development is all about, right? So as we know, over the years, we managed to get a lot of reproducibility because when 70% of patients respond, that's when you get 16 trials that are all positive, 16 trials with abiraterone, enzalutamide, darolutamide, apalutamide, all positive. But there is that 30% that is highly resistant and they are enriched for high risk localized disease. I'm going to come to that. We know that earlier is better, but we also know that using more castration leads to less, right? That's the downside of it. It can actually curtail your survival by causing other adverse events. Let's go on to the next slide. Her Oh, that moved around. Okay, there we go. So what haven't we done? We have not reached any therapeutic strategy that is effective for localized iris disease. And we have not yet put in stone, written it up, predictors of outcome to guide therapy selection. That's not because anyone's lazy. It's very hard to come up with validation strategies because you know, I will show you, we have explored and we have identified candidates, but unless you actually validate it, you will not be able to use it in that expanded scale that I was referring to earlier. It's different when somebody comes to institutions such as the one I was before, the one I am, or other big institutions where we can within our tumor boards discuss and say, hey, we've got the stampede data. We've got these young men, let's discuss new adjuvant strategies because we can put them within a trial, we can put them within a true protocol and the like. Imagine all the big community practices. We don't even want to take such risks unless it's validated. So let's go on to the next slide. There we go. These are all the trials that I have conducted with some that I inherited. You, you might not start somewhere around 2004 when I was doing my training at Anderson. But before that, I actually inherited and reported because I did the analysis. And you can see they were using chemotherapy for neoadjuvant. But if you scroll down, you'll see that all the most recent trials have to do with abiraterone, have to do with apalutamide, with enzalutamide. We're actually planning with darolutamide, as some of you know, which we consider a drug to be safer. So let me give you an overview of what this data has shown. Next slide, her please. Press on, press on through so we can show the whole thing. And then I'll actually, there we go, there we go. Nope, go back, went a little bit extra. Huh. There we go, okay. So this is a lot of, of, I'm gonna try to explain it. We did a bunch of trials where we were using on one arm, just castration on the other arm, castration plus abiraterone or castration plus enzalutamide and more recently apalutamide and the like. And we saw that if you give for three to six months to a man who has high risk localized disease, one of the new agents plus, of course, limited castration, that's it, three to six months, no more, not beyond and you go on to surgery, you will get a prostate out and the lymph nodes, and you will be able to assess how much tumor volume is left inside. I want you to understand 
that when you take out a prostate in a man who has high risk localized disease, you will see that within this prostate, there is a percentage of cancer cells and a percentage of normal tissue. Prostate cancer does not usually create what we call a solid sheet. It actually has pockets and foci of cancer. And those pockets have different extent of cancer cells. So with a pathologist and having trained with them, we developed a strategy where we're just not reporting only Gleason score, only pathology stage, but also the cancer volume that's left behind. And the dots that you see in red and blue here are actually showing the different volumes of cancer. And in the red is men who have been exposed to one of the new drugs. And in the blue is only if you use androgen deprivation, old school castration for three to six months. You can see that the tumors in the red seem to be smaller overall, but you can see that some red dots are actually high up there. These are the resistant tumors. These are the tumors that we need to focus on. I'm not trying to make a negative comment here. I'm trying to say that these are the cases where you need to better understand why they are resistant. Because I guarantee you, and I've discussed this with a lot of you, when you treat the cancer initially with androgen deprivation plus a new drug, PSA is going to go to zero. It's going to go to zero. But you take that prostate out and you may see almost no cancer left behind, or you may see 80% cancer volume in there, even though there's no PSA and very happy cancer. So that's exactly the resistant form of it. And if you go actually to the graph, the Kaplan-Meier plot that I have on the right, you will see this is actually, this graph here shows the time to progression, the time to relapse of prostate cancer. Those men who responded very well to even three months of hormones, I kid you not, and got organ confined disease and very small volume of cancer left behind, they were cancer free seven years later. The ones who even though had a PSA zero, had quite a bit of resistant prostate cancer there, those were actually the ones that relapsed the faster. Now, there is a phase three trial right now ongoing that I'm participating in that is actually using this approach with apalutamide. I fear that this trial is actually setting too high a bar and it's looking for a cancer volume of zero or almost zero to actually call it a success. We will know in about a year those results, but essentially that trial will report on whether the treatment with apalutamide can lead to undetectable almost cancer upon prostatectomy. I would argue you don't need undetectable. You need small volumes. And that will be the success. Now, this is something that is ongoing. And as I said, we're also striving to identify what could be drivers of resistance. Let's go on to the next slide, Herb. There we go. And this is work that we did right, right when we we're in the middle of COVID, where we identified that those patients who actually had tumors that had either a lack of expression, such as P10, or high proliferation, or high expression of a marker called the glucocorticoid receptor, or even presence of what some of you may have heard, a splice variant of the androgen receptor, were the ones that belonged in this category. And they could be Gleason 8 and respond wonderfully well, or be Gleason 7 and not respond well. So that is where the genomic players come, come in. And what we're going to try to do in a prospective trial that we will show in the next uh, slide is actually to try to, uh, to, to test, to validate in a way whether we can select those men out 
that are going to perform wonderfully well with the simple combination for only six months and then going on to surgery versus not. Now, as a lot of you discuss all the time, the other option that there is, and it has now been tested with the Stampede data, is to actually use hormones for two or three years and combine it with radiation. So our goal is, as I said, to limit the exposure to hormones. And I think that this strategy, which may be combined with surgery, and of course, you all know the limitations there, may be more appropriate for some men who do not want a long-term exposure to castration. Let's go on to the next slide. So that's, that's the actual um, predictive signature testing. And this is going to be with darolutamide. Um, some of you who've discussed it with me have uh, actually shared with me also their impressions of the dis different drugs. I personally have experienced very good safety profile with darolutamide. It's a little harder to get but it's not insurmountable. And I think in the coming year, it's going to be actually easier to prescribe. And it's a drug that's not just only easy to tolerate, it's also a drug that essentially may have some drug direct interactions, but in my combination with Orgovix, with Relugolix, it has been quite well tolerated. And with the exception of just a a couple of people I have not had to tweak the doses at all. Now I've put their LHRH, but I'm trying to convince um, the the IRB to allow me to use Relugolix. There's a little bit of kickback because of those drug drug interactions. The reasons why I like Relugolix, as you know well, is because it allows for recovery of the testosterone much faster, and it also is um, a drug that has shown that it at least has half the risk for cardiovascular events when it's given for a whole year even. So let's go on to the next slide. And actually, no, Herb, I think I'm gonna stop there and discuss with you all. Let's go on to, yeah, right here. Let's stop right here and get your thoughts. Some of you are in this stage of discussing your high risk localized, but I wanted your thoughts on how you would like a trial that's going to limit as much the exposure to hormones and try to get you the best outcome. So, so my question, Lenny, is, you know, we've been reading about de novo non-metastatic and triple therapy, including both you know, Abby and LHRH and a taxol. Yeah, docetaxel, right? So, so where does so where does that fit in here? Um. I'll be honest with you, docetaxel, in my humble opinion, is an overkill. I'm not saying that it doesn't, it's not appropriate for some people, but you know, this is a different discussion that we need to have. We have seven trials, seven trials that are proving the importance of using hormones in the setting of, this is metastatic hormone naive disease, and we have one trial the Stampy trial that showed for this high-risk localized disease, the importance, even on survival, very high-risk disease. The two trials that have shown the benefit of docetaxel in combination with, apolud with sorry, abiraterone and in combination with darolutamide are not comparing with hormones. Right. They are comparisons with docetaxel. So essentially, we do not know if the triplet therapy is better than the doublet. And instead of using docetaxel, you were using abiraterone alone or apalutamide or mm -hmm. enzalutamide or darolutamide just to be equal opportunity here. So you only have proof that the triplet is better than docetaxel in castration. You don't have proof that for the, the whole population. And actually the data is more supportive of the high volume disease rather than the low volume disease. So that's another big concern. 
Now there's one trial that's called Enzymet that was done half here, half in Australia. And that trial had a lot of docetaxel in, and it did not show that the triplet offered any benefit compared to the doublet. So the data is a little bit conflicted. And I would argue that for me to use docetaxel plus hormones, plus enhanced antigen signal inhibitor, um, it would have to be a very aggressive phenotype of disease. It would have to be a man who has liver metastases. And I would do that if I did not identify any genomic events such as, let's say, BRCA or something else where I would try to even go for a PARP inhibitor. I see some comments in there. How, um, how did they define high volume versus low volume there? So high volume and low volume, this is a story, it's, a, it's called the glass classification and it started about 20 years ago. In fact, it started in my department, my old department at Anderson with a trial that was done back in the days where they were using adriamycin and ketoconazole. And it was defined as a man who either has more than five bone metastases in a bone scan or has metastases that are in organs such as liver or lung, what we call visceral metastases or adrenals. So it was an effort to identify the more aggressive phenotype of the disease. Now, let me back up here and say the following. The fact that a man comes in to see us and he may not have these metastases doesn't mean that he does not have a phenotype that may turn aggressive, right? This is dynamic. This is the moment in time where it was diagnosed. We just assume that because a disease that's more aggressive goes in a faster pace, we're actually picking up just by looking at scans, the more aggressive subtype of disease. So this is only what we call a surrogate of what is the aggressiveness. The real aggressiveness of the disease should come through molecular characterization. And of course, Gleason 9 and 10 could be enriched for that, but it turns out that Gleason is not enough either. Right. So uh, I'm just going to jump in for a second and ask Dr. E, can we um, extend, because I think the guys would like to talk to you and I think you got everybody's attention. So we, we can we can go over the hour into our support meeting if it's good for you and allow them to talk to you a little bit more. Is that okay by you? Sure, sure. I just don't want you, we can always also continue the discussion because this is a lot to process. And you can share the slides and everything with everyone because we should have the time to come back and, you know, ideas and thoughts. Because I want to understand, you know, I know that if we look into high risk localized, a man comes in the door, he has Gleason 9, he's a young man or a fit guy, it doesn't matter. It's all, it's all biologic, it's not chronologic. And you are offered, we've had this discussion, Rick, you're offered radiation versus surgery. Would the time, I've had these discussions with Neil Shore and we're always debating, would the exposure to hormones make a difference? If you were to say, I can get away with six months or four months of hormones and then go into a good, you know, good OR with a good surgeon, I won't have my incontinence. I will have, you may lose though your erectile function. Or do I prefer the two to three year exposure to hormones plus the radiation, which in the long term will also cost me my, my erectile function, but I won't have incontinence, but I may have side effects. There's a trade off, right? That's the main thing to understand what you're looking for. And then, of course, it is our goal to identify the very aggressive disease subtype and then say, hey, all bets are off here, you guy. You have to take this treatment. You have to. But my main thing is a quality of life question here. I want to understand what would be the best of the two options. So I have an idea. 
if we can go to the screen, um, if we can go to everybody's screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do that. And, let's... See, and see all the icons, but, but Dr. E, we only get 25 icons and we've got 43 people on the call, but that's okay. Um, if we go back to the, back to our regular screen, Herb, let's ask yeah, the guys. Should we, should let's be ask back, the guys. we should be back to our regular screen. Okay. Yeah. Let's ask the guys for a show of hands, or you can use the hand function if you've got the hand function and you can see it. But how many gents here would prefer to, um, to go through surgery and shorter amount of hormone therapy um, with the possible outcome that that might be the end of it versus the other option where um, you go through radiation, you may go through hormone therapy, you may even go through debulking surgery as well, um, but you're gonna be on, on hormone therapy on and off sometimes for the rest of your life. Can we, that, why don't we ask, who prefers the surgery plus the, plus the shorter therapy? So no. wait a minute. So, and and let, let's, let's do it the other way around, okay? If you can take your hands down, I'll clear all the hands. And uh, can I clear the hands? I don't know if I can. Somebody should be able to get yeah, the hands. Yeah, are yeah, down. yeah, they did. They did. Hands are down. Now, who would prefer to go through, not go through surgery, but with the possibility that you could be dealing with hormone therapy intermittent or continuous for many, many years? Can we see a show of hands on that? Body call. Okay. Now, Rick, Rick, just to clarify for me, the former option involves going on hormone therapy before the surgery, right? Yes. Correct. Yes. But and what then, happens with that? It's 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 six months. Six months, right? Right. We all know, and and I can see faces that know that nothing is written in stone. But if you fall into that 60, 70 percent of folks that get organ confined disease, you're good to go. The bets are off if you have, and that's why we need predictive markers, exactly like they do in breast cancer. They're gonna tell you, hey, you need to go on hormones, you need chemo plus hormones, you need, or targeted therapy plus hormones. That's a different story, right? I'm more trying to get your quality of life going under the knife with a six month treatment versus at least two years of exposure to hormones, which is the current standard. And I'm talking about, you know, ADT plus Abby or Enza or whichever, plus radiation. So that's kind of the question. And from what I could see, it was half half. Did I get it yeah. right? That's, yeah, what, that's what it, it sure yeah. looked. It sure looked like that to 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 uh, to me. Um, it, it, it's. Um, I like that. I like that because I want to ask next, what would convince folks? Because I think the fear is the surgery. That's the big fear. So it's not everybody wants less hormones, right? That's a given. Uh, here's the question. How can we make, I bet you've had these discussions, more fail-proof the surgery, right? The fear is the incontinence, I'm assuming here. Well, I think it's both the erectile, it's the incontinence, but it's also the ED, Dr. E, as well. Well, the, the problem with, with, with radiation, and I bet you radiation oncologists don't speak about it. When you get those 76 grays, the problem is that two to three years later, right. there's a high chance you will lose erectile function because of that late effect of radiation. And the other problem is not for the youngsters here, you know, the older folks that unfortunately after two to three years of exposure to hormones, there's a 10 to 20% chance that you will not recover your testosterone. 
and then you're yeah. stuck. It's going to be very interesting, you guys. We have a GU ASCO, a meeting where, you know, it's going to be five of us having kind of a debate where I've been asked to, to talk about supplementation with testosterone. And you all know that that's a big, big debate. Like a lot of physicians are afraid to give testosterone when in prostate cancer history patients. So yeah. these are the concerns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what are you going to say? I don't know yet. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, we're going to talk about bipolar there, androgen uh, deprivation as well. But I actually think that if it's been a few years, uh, I, I, I would dare say that I would offer with a lot of caution. With a lot of caution and a lot of, you know, monitoring. You can't, you can't deny somebody the opportunity to get back their testosterone if you feel comfortable they're cured. And we have a few guys who um, are supplementing testosterone. Not many, but we do have guys. I don't know if there's anybody on right now, but we do have guys that, that, that are supplementing their testosterone who, who had high-risk recurrent disease, but they've been, they've been clear for a while. See, I think one of the things with surgery and high risk disease is to what extent, if you go through the surgery, do you think you're going to need radiation as well? The, you know, which I use the MSKCC nomogram for. Now, if, if you now have better predictive methods from the pathology of the removed prostate, um, you know, maybe a, a nomogram will be developed over time that will assure people that if they have the surgery, they won't need radiation as well. If they have hormone therapy and surgery, they need the assurance. Well, I'm not going to have to go through hormone uh, uh, radiation as well. E, e, right? We agree, and 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 a lot of it, as you know, a lot of it, as you know, is very personalized. And as long as you're speaking to a man. And I see that some raised hands that want to make comments, I believe. Um, uh, as long as you're a student of mine and you have an understanding, you have an understanding, this is very personalized. If you have, let's say, margin positivity, margin positivity, and you've got low volume disease, and you've got an undetectable PSA with a full throttle testosterone not 300s 400s normal testosterone you can give that man the benefit of waiting as long as you are really monitoring and you want that recovery that healing process of at least five to six months we've had this discussion a lot of times so just being anxious and jumping up and down and saying let's go for radiation after surgery closely after surgery is not going to cut it if you're going to cause, you know, irreparable damage afterwards. Yes. So yeah. it's, it's very much about that interaction. But having said that, we're all human. And I want you to always keep in mind that when a surgeon sees that there's positive margin or lymph node positivity, they obviously take it as a personal failure, even though it's not, right? And they, they get very anxious. And sometimes they pull the trigger a little bit too fast to get things done. And this is what we need to fix. This is what I was saying earlier, education, patience, rethink it. And this is what I was saying. You got to be your best advocates. You got to be, you got to be partnering up with that practice that you're in right. and, and be patient with them too, because they're, they're pretty anxious. I can tell you that when they see yeah. such outcomes, you, you know, you have one of our t-shirts and you wear it proudly. Dr. Yeah, I'm not Ray. wearing it right now. I apologize. No, I but you office. know what it says. You know what it says. Be your own best advocate. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, just, I, I've made an executive decision. And apologies to anybody who came in for the support portion only. But we're going to extend a half hour and see how we do because we got a lot of questions and and we want to get people asking some questions. And who knows? Maybe Dr. E's got more questions for us just to see a show of hands. Jim, and, and I think we lost Herb. I don't know what happened. I saw he he left, and I don't see that he's come back, so I'll I'll take over from Herb. Um, Jim B, put on that microphone and ask your question. 
Oh, what question is that? You kind of put me on the spot there. Oh, you have your hand up. Oh, no, I gave a thumbs up for continuing on with Dr. E. Oh, okay. Well, we got to lower your hand. Let's see. Who else? Who else has a question right now? I don't see any other hands. Peter, uh, does, Peter does, and he's on the phone. Oh, Peter on the telephone, all the way from Maui. Okay, okay, Mr. K, go ahead. So, uh, Dr. Laney, I'm an anomaly. I'm a, a, a mismatch repair guy, and I've been through surgery, two kinds of radiation, chemotherapy, and finally, eight and a half years later, Ketruda is working and my PSA has dropped to the bottom of the ocean. I can't, I can't believe, and why did it take eight and a half years? <laughs> I don't know, but I, my, my uh, MSI was stable initially, but then it turned high later on, four years later. But my question is, had my uh, primary care physician or had my uh, urologist tested me for germline mutation, I, I play around in my head, I have nightmares about this, could have I avoided all treatment and gone straight to Keytruda and been cured eight and a half years ago? So back then they wouldn't have given you Keytruda is what I'm going to tell you. I, I know, I know. I don't have regrets, but it, no, but no, no, no. Should, they, should they be testing? Should they be testing for germline right now in the urologist's office or in the? Oh yeah. In the. You um, want to hear? It gets even crazier. Um, there's this myth. There's this myth, and some of you know about it, that there's not enough of geneticists to go around, and that's why we're not doing germline testing. That's not true. Uh, I don't believe it. I don't believe now, it. That's not, we definitely don't have, but we don't need them. Only 7 to 10% of patients have germline mutations. So we as physicians can request a test, and only if it comes positive do you speak to the geneticist. If 90 plus percent of cases are going to be negative, you don't have to wait up front to see the geneticist. You see the geneticist when it's positive. So that's the way to do it. And that's how we've been doing it, quite a few of us. But somebody put in there, I don't have enough of information or knowledge. And I understand you got to do some homework. But back to your point, a lot of physicians do not have that information or refuse that information. I will give you an example. I have a patient just like you who had MSI high, developed 12 years after diagnosis, 12. And thank God I was allowed to do a second MSI because the patient could afford it and took it somewhere else and did it out of pocket. Because when I was had requested it back in the day at Anderson, the pathologist refused to do it because they were insisting that MS status does not change, which is false. Right. So what I'm going to say is a lot of times we physicians are actually so biased by our old knowledge that we're don't, not ready to accept new knowledge. So that's why I'm saying you have to be your best advocates. And this is something that's not necessarily criticism, it's human nature. And again, back to your point, it's no point of you know being deleterious to yourself and saying, but you know the other implication is, how about your kids? So this gentleman who had the MSH3 mutation germline, he was refused germline testing and MSH3 mutation was found and his 45 year old son has it who had actually just developed muscle invasive bladder cancer. Oh my gosh. Thankfully made it through because it was early on in diagnosis. So this is where it becomes a very big consideration. And this is why I'm saying at least request it. Nothing bad can come of it, requesting germline testing. And the more comprehensive it is, the better. Right now, we've reached a point where we can request up to 90. I know, Herb, I think you were telling me that. Was it Herb that you were telling me? Or somebody was telling me that the NCI does a, a wider panel. As long as, right. yeah. As long as you do over 40 genes, that pretty much covers it. And again, always remember, if you have family history 
and it's negative, it doesn't mean that it's negative. It means that we don't know, right? Negative means mm. only that we don't know. In two, three years, we may know more. So I also have some questions coming in from Joe. I don't want to. Yes. Joe, Joe, why don't you voice, turn on your mic and voice your question to Dr. E. And we've got some uh, hands up from Norm and from Tony, if I'm getting right. it right. I, I, my, my question is basically in either of these scenarios, what's the influence of, I hate to use the word advanced, but age? Uh, and, well, you know, with, you know, that's a good sorry. question. Yeah. Age is just an idea, right? Okay, I'll tell you why. It was a couple of weeks ago, I was with my fellow in the clinic, and, and this gentleman who is 81 year old, 80, no, 85 year old showed up, 85 year old. I kid you not, the guy looked like a 60 year old. He was a veteran, Vietnam veteran, pilot, trainee people still to this day. High risk localized. I was shocked. The guy was super fit, active. Same day, 57 year old man shows up, metabolic syndrome, uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension through the roof. You tell me who's fit and who's not. Chronology is just chronology. However, the problem with chronology is that even though you may be fit and you know your muscle tone and all of it doing good mental status amazing, you still have 86 year old kidney, 86 year old liver, 86 year old lung and heart. So that's the problem. That's a big risk there. But you know, if you have comorbidities, that are compromising you, even if you're 60 or 55, you should not go for surgery. Like I've got these morbidly obese gentlemen, I mean, they can't go for surgeries. So I, I think it's a balance of things, but chronology should not limit us unless we're looking at very, very high ages. I have even 90 year olds, obviously, I would not recommend surgery for those gentlemen. So can I just ask for a quick comment on that from Dr. Jack? What comment? Put, put Mark. I, I'm being an old guy. Um, <laughs> surgery for an old guy and treatment for an old guy. I mean, you fit into this. Uh, you you you're one of these guys who fits into this uh, this uh, air air pilot category. Thank you very much. That's very kind. I'm not sure about that, but uh, my situation is very different because I had surgery 20 years ago, Rick, and, uh, you know, Scardino, I thought, did a great job, but, uh, you know, five years ago, I had a biochemical reoccurrence. It so slowly has crept up, and right now, I just sent my slides to Peter Carroll to do an assessment because there's a discrepancy between the read at, um, at Sylvester that read me on a PSMA, a recent PSMA, and a uh, eczema scan as being negative, and Sloan Kettering just came back with it. Uh, they think it's positive in my my mediastinal lymph nodes. So oh, wow. I'm, I'm sort of I'm stuck in a real anxious dilemma, and uh, I don't know what to do. If, if have you had any? That. Have you had any anatomic imaging for the mediastinum? Is it very small anatomically? The lesion. It's very small. It's very. It's in the millimeters. It's like two or two, two or three little small nodules that haven't grown over time. Uh, uh -huh. The last PSMA scan I had a Sloan Kettering done a year ago, April 1st of 2021, didn't light up anything, uh, but it, it, the, the measurement hasn't grown at all, and they followed up. I've had about seven scans. I've had everything, and, and I had nothing in the pelvic bed, uh, nothing in the prostatic fossa. Nothing seems to be showing up anywhere, and to go 20 years out and be, being told it's indolent, slow-growing, and you don't have to worry about it. I was told that by Scardino. I was told that by Aquan. I was told that by Carol. I've been told that by everybody, and all of a sudden, for it to land in my lungs and being told I've got stage possible stage four disease. I mean, it's, 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 I, I feel overwhelmed by it. And uh, Sloan Kettering, they said they see it all the time. I said, really? Whew. So that's, yeah, that's not I'm... that's not you know the, the term all the time is exaggerating. Obviously, when there's an exotic case, it will show up in places like you know people like us who see only prostate cancer. Obviously. But all the time is an exaggeration. After 20 years, now I want you to think about it, Jack. You were you were how old when you had your operation? 
uh, 20 to 63. Okay. So think about three this. Margins, three, so four, think three about margins. it this way. Yeah. If you have, how much is your PSA how, now? Uh, it's uh, first slowly risen and now it's suddenly taken off 1.15. Okay. So we know you have cancer cells in you. Think about it. Think about it clearly. You have had them for 20 years. You have clearly had them for 20 years. They didn't just show up. They were there. And your own immune response has been such for 20 years, your own, without any intervention, that you fully controlled it. What's the difference? You're aging. That's the difference. You're aging and you're, immuno, you're more immunocompromised. I hate to say it, but this is just yeah. pure logic. This is not a new cancer. So obviously your life right now is not threatened, but what everyone's trying to do is to actually safeguard you for that. And that's the balance right now. If you think about it, it's the balance from over-treating and jumping in and doing things that may harm you versus kind of sitting there and saying, hey, should I act, should I not act? And everyone's sitting on the fence. I understand it, that's the problem. But the bottom line is for such situations such as yours, and I have similar cases and like <clears throat> with the MS, MSH uh, mutation, 12 years later, 15 years later, 20, that's immunocompromised. You've had it. You've had this cancer there. So it's lying dormant, micrometastatic for years, and it just woke up because my- Exactly. My, it didn't wake up. It's been awake. Working. It's been awake. It's just, you've been controlling it. Your immune cells have been identifying those cancer cells and keeping them at bay. But now it's getting an opportunity to grow. So it reached a critical mass that allowed it to express PSA and we were able to go on and do the scans. Is it in the mediastinum or not? I don't know, I haven't seen your scans, but it's somewhere. But it's not threatening your life at this time. It is not. Tell but we why. now have tools. I'm sorry? What? Why isn't it threatening my life? I, you know. It is not. Think about it. You have a tiny mediastinal nodule, plus minus, that people are arguing whether it is cancer or not. Your life is not being threatened. Think about How it. Do I because you're getting tied up in this. It's it's like um, <clears throat> like um, kind of you know you get all so, all stressed over it. Yeah. You have to take the time to study this and not jump and overreact. Well, if it can be biopsied by an interventional radiologist, maybe that would be useful through the back or something if it can be done, but it's so small, it's a little risky. And it the is whole risky. issue, I think, my, my medical oncologist, a good man, and, and he, and not the one at Sloan Kettering, the one down here in Miami, he said to me, you know, your choices are three. Don't treat it, don't do anything, and let's see what happens. Two, alternate, alternative um, um, ADT, however, whatever combination, or six months on, six months off, or go for the pelvic yeah. shot and go for the cure. Yeah, uh, we, can actually, we can actually discuss that uh, at a different time. Well, this is a great- I think, I think this would be better. I would suggest we take that offline sometime. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Right. I, I oh, want to, because I'm, I'm cognizant of time and I see other people, I want, I see yeah. that Alan is, is raising things like, okay. I'm so, you know, I'm so Alan, sorry, I'm so appreciative. No, 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 Jack at all. I actually find it extremely interesting. Um, but Alan is bringing up some valid points. I don't know if you can see them, Rick and Herb and Joe, yeah, yes. you know, Alan, yes. do you want to elaborate on that? Is he yeah, there? So, so I can go into the university library. I work at Penn State and I can read, you know, I've been reading research, but it doesn't help me see the big picture. I sit here and listen to you and I am friggin' overwhelmed tonight. So I want to yep. look at, I want to see it all. I want to understand it so that I can then participate with my medical oncologist to say, okay, let's talk about this. Um, and, and right now where I am, uh, you know, I just got radiation and now I'm on hormone uh, therapy four months into it. My PSA was less than, you know, 0.05. So I'm, I was a happy camper until I came here tonight. <laughs> you should still be a happy camper. No, no, no. This is not meant to, to stress you out. This is meant to, to speak to the complexity of the disease, right? right. Because yeah. what we need to is more information, more knowledge. This is like the story 
with PSA screening, you guys. About 10 years ago, the US task force decided we shouldn't do PSA screening because we were over treating people and we were mutilating people. Rather than say, let's get those urologists in a room and kind of teach them a few things. They said, let's, and what did it lead to? To overdiagnosis of high risk disease and metastatic disease. So knowledge right. is never bad, but it shouldn't freak us out and shouldn't lead us to over treatment. So this is what this is all about. But Alan, we all learn every day and it just needs time. And you have that luxury. With prostate cancer, more than not, you all have that luxury of time to learn. But I really, I love the idea of, you know, how, how trusting patients are, patients are of their doctors, but you have to have your own back so that you can actually support the practice that you're with becomes important. And this is not meant because I'm saying that they don't know what they're doing or anything like that to the contrary, but you are a unique person. You need to have your own back and you need, of course, your, your team to be your advocates, but you need to do your homework. You have responsibilities for your own future. That's yeah, what I mean. Something That's besides what. read research articles. That's what I'm thinking. Yes. You know, and when when my you know medical oncologist says you have aggressive cancer, you know, well, whatever you need to do, doctor, you know, just do it. Just go after it aggressively, then, you know, because I want to live. I got grandchildren. I want to. So of course, of course, and you got to draw the line where you can't overdo it. That's yep. the important part. That's right. the important part. But you know what? You gave me an idea. I was There's a lot of these CME events that are happening for doctors. Today, I was having a meeting with a doctor who's creating these, and they create chat rooms. And you, what you're saying, Alan, it would be great. Forget CMEs, but for you guys, and Rick, I'll, I'll probably try to put you in touch with that team to create interfaces that while you're doing something, you can go in and flip through, you know, graphics slides that present that data in a more organized fashion so you can get because you can't really dig into that research and get all of that insight i think that's a great idea so uh, we've um we hope that attending these sessions educates you a good deal um that that that's our that's our real desire and i think it does for some people um but we you know, we don't get overly technical because we would lose a lot of people, but we rely on our brains trust. Speaking of which, Len, you've got a question. Yeah, I do. Uh, <clears throat> so Dr. E, um, traditionally we've, we've seen most oncologists putting a thumbs down on intermittent hormone therapy, but lately, as in the last few years, we're seeing a lot more uh, GU Medox saying yes to intermittent hormone therapy. So part one, what is your view on that? And part two, do you, th I'm assuming it's yes. And part two, um, do you think oncologists should be getting maybe a little more creative with IHT, like maybe cycling three months on, three months off, six months on, six months off, something like that, when appropriate? Great, great thoughts uh, there. Listen, um, I even presented and published a trial using intermittent with with Aberrata, and it wasn't that case because that's what we had, and it was good. But I, I think we can do better because now, let me give you an example. In Jack's case, the PSMA showed a spot uh, there, which is a difficult spot. But if the PSMA shows a unique bone lesion, let's say, for instance, you could do that intermittent in combination with an SBRT of that specific spot. Mm -hmm. This, you know, we just had the San Antonio data present uh, that there may be value in that approach. It has not been validated, but based on the do no harm, the team should evaluate if that lesion is safe to provide that SBRT. I think that will be a step above just the intermittent. If you, I just had a patient who came in with a PSA 2, all anatomic imaging and all molecular imaging negative. I want to open a parenthesis because it's really important. We're all really excited about PET PSMA, but I want you all to remember 
that PET PSMA is only as good as what it picks up. For it to be positive, the cancer cells need to have PSMA on them. If they don't have it, the PET will not be positive. So anatomic imaging, MRIs, scans are equally important and good radiologists to read them. So with that in mind, when you have that PSA rise, I like to take the time, as a lot of you know, to find where the lesion is before we engage into hormones and hormones and hormones. That is where I have my only hold back because if there's only a PSA rise and there's no lesion, as I'm getting older, I'm thinking, where's the threat? I only have a PSA here. I don't see a lesion. So where's the danger? Why would I castrate a man for that rather than give him the opportunity to maximize what he can do with his own lifestyle until we pick up where that is? That would be my only, you know, if you asked me two years ago prior to pets and the like, I would be like, mm, I'm with you. Let's do six months. But now I'm, I'm, I'm holding back a little bit. The cycling, I'm, so, I'm, you're going to hear about that during GU ASCO. I'm still thinking about it. That's why. But I'm, I'm open so, to it. Yeah. We have one more question. Tony Fig, I see you have your hand, yeah, hand up. Yeah, up for a while. Tony. Yeah, my question is on uh, cancer cells that are not expressing themselves uh, on a PSMA. I had a radical prostate me in July and recurrence is showing up on PSA after 45 days and the PSMA did not pick up anything. However, on that scan, it did show uh, 2.1 by 1.1 centimeter uh, soft tissue mass, or I guess maybe it's called a hematoma. And um, I'm supposed to be starting radiation in another month, but I'm hesitant to do that, but how, is there any way of telling if uh, tissues are not expressing themselves and if that is you know, where the cancer is located and giving the PSA numbers? What's your PSA, Tony? Uh, it, it was after surgery, it was 3.7, then uh, 3.9. And I started on um, uh, Firmagon and now it's uh, negligible less than 0.2. How long has it been th since your surgery? Um, four months. And so they're, they're wanting to start around month five. Now, usually, and I would agree, uh, if there is concern that the pathology stage showed disease outside at the margins or some nodes that are positive, yes, radiation, as long as you've recovered, is a good way to go. But you are correct in saying that there's no way of knowing if it was just right there of, or if some cancer cells have traveled outside. And this is why they're giving you this combination with the hormones now. The question is for how long they're going to keep it. Uh, I would argue that they're probably gonna try to treat you with hormones for at least a year. Is that what they told you? Yes, and they did 31 lymph nodes and everything was negative and the margins were Great. negative. Great. Have they done that germline and testing of the tumor like we were discussing earlier? Yes, I have a check two germline mutation. The Gleason was nine, grade five, and Decipher was 1.0. So you need a, a more uh, detailed also testing of the tumor. Check two germline. Mm -hmm. Did they offer you the opportunity to get on a trial with a PARP inhibitor or not? No, no. no. So you got to be careful with the check too, because it means that those cancer cells have the potential to have traveled outside the pelvis through the bloodstream. But this is not something that you can do anything about right now. It's just very important that you continue to monitor the disease in the future. It may be that it would just in the pelvic area you will know that two years from now. That's when you'll know if you're cancer free. That does not mean again that you're you're right now in any danger. Your life is not in danger. 
It's more a matter of a long-term exposure to hormones and how you can make the most of your own lifestyle, improve your diet, improve your exercise, you know, improve your emotional state, reduce your stress levels. This is what your opportunity is right now. And two years from now, we will know if you're cancer free. And if you're not, you're going to get a next shot of trying to get cancer free. So that's what I want for everyone to walk away. That's the main thing. We've got that opportunity now. But as far as tissues not expressing or showing anything, can you comment on that? I don't think that it doesn't show anything because if you have germline check two, your tissue is showing check two. I don't know if right. a full foundation testing has been set. We can have further discussions on that. And I think Rick, it would be nice one day. And I bet you guys have discussed that to actually sit down and try to explain what it means to do a germline testing and a tumor testing and what the differences are. Oh, uh, we, we cover that often in the group. Yeah, but it would be nice. Well, maybe they don't get, we, yeah, but we do talk. And, and Tony, I think we've talked about this and we yeah. suggest that you, that you ask your doc to get you a foundation medicine or, or Tempus or one of, one of those other tests from, from the tissue that's been right. taken and it has to be done. I mean, this is what Dr. E is saying. Um, but it's okay. it, it will happen with time. It's not urgent. So again, keep in mind, none of this should be like, you know, have the discussions, repeat them, ask for it again. It will happen. It won't change your course right now. That's all I'm saying. Okay. We're going to have one. We really oh. want to thank you so much. This was an incredibly wonderful session. <laughs> we, we all, we can't imagine how much we all appreciate your support for all of our group and for individuals. And, 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 and this was terrific tonight. And you're welcome to come back anytime. We'd be Thank you to very you. much for having me. And happy holidays, everyone. Please. And yeah. anyone who has more questions, thoughts, you know, I'm here. Just email, text me, you know, whatever. Twitter, whatever. All of it. <laughs> like, the whole thing. Yeah, we, right. you, you know, I just want to say, you, you know we love you here. You know it. And, and you. Um, you have... An open invitation. I don't want to impose on you. You know that. So anytime you want to come in and talk to us before, during, after a meeting, and the guys will always have want to talk to you, we'd love it. Well, you love it. And I, but but I, I also would, would argue we do. And today's presentation was obviously wonderfully targeted towards those initial stages and what could be happening early on. Uh, but we are have a group here which is pretty much like me we're in the later stages of castration resistance and that's let's a whole do, other let's do too. this then after gu asco when we're going to have a lot of data let's have another meeting to discuss that data because okay it's let's do that okay now that's great we're going to go into our regular meeting you are very welcome to stay and audit. Welcome to stay you or not your, you can turn your camera off and go get your dinner and do all of that and listen and jump in anytime we you we're not throwing you out but i no, am no, going no. To... I, I will I, ha I will have to leave because i promise you i have not even gift wrapped or written any of the cards for my team members i have to get it done we're <laughs> heading in a freeze thank you all you have a good okay. night Good night. Great. Good night. Okay. Am I